So 1 million percent, yes, software engineering is still worth it. And it's going to be worth it for at least 10 to 20 more years, in my opinion. Then, oh, what if I just did that? And maybe I would have gotten an interview, you know? Welcome to my podcast. I'm your host, Sajad. And today we have a very exciting guest. His name is Eric of Sweet Eric Codes on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. And we're going to be covering all things as a computer science student starter pack. We're going to be talking about projects. We're going to be talking about resume. We're going to be talking about AI. We have a lot of different things. And he himself is an accomplished individual. And with that being said, let's get started right away. Hey, Eric, uh, hope you're doing well. Thank you so much for joining us on today's video. And I kind of just want to get straight into it in that one of my main purposes of having this channel and page is demystifying the tech world, the tech industry, uh, whether that's software engineering, computer science, or I guess in your case, computer engineering. And I actually want to get started right there of why you chose computer engineering over computer science and on that point why you chose software over hardware uh, okay so first of all uh i didn't know if i was going to choose computer engineering software engineering or cs when i was in high school so i decided to focus on my grades for the last two years uh here in canada basically only the top six marks matter so I focused on my courses like math, physics, chemistry, and ended with a 97.75 top six average. Uh, this was good enough to get into every single Canadian school, and I even wait. Hold up, hold up. What, what, what is a top six average? Could you, could you break that down? Uh, the top six average I don't think is, we have that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. So a top six average is essentially your top six marks, but there's the caveat where you need to have the the marks that are relevant for this program you're applying to. So for example, in engineering you have to have math, physics, chemistry, and English included, and then you fill out the other two with your remaining top marks. And this basically just mm -hmm. ensures you're not padding your average by taking courses that are easy. So with this high average, uh, I was able to gain scholarships at Waterloo, U of T, UBC, uh, even McGill. And it was a really tough decision to decide which school to choose because McGill does have a bit of a less prestige in comparison to Waterloo's engineering program for sure. But I fell in love with the city and I really valued the work-life balance and it's something that I really respect in my life. So that's why I ended up choosing McGill. Uh, I ended mm -hmm. up choosing CE over, over CS simply because I'm looking to pursue my MBA later on. And I know that an engineering degree plus MBA is one of the most sought after and high paying degrees in the world. And now with AI taking over, it would also allow me to pivot my career into hardware or into management if that were to happen. Um, but overall, you did choose software, right? Like right now uh, you, you did choose software. Yeah. So now, so I'm, I am a computer engineering student, but then I'm going to minor in mm -hmm. software engineering and all of my internships and work experience and personal projects are on the software related side. And that's really just because I am someone who doesn't like hardware as much. I entered university, not sure if I like coding more than hardware. Uh, even though I'm pretty good at both, I just prefer coding. So yeah, I, I decided see, to pivot into software engineering. Okay, okay. So then I guess your plan of doing engineering and then MBA, is there going to be coding in that? Or is it going to be kind of like a hardware main focus there? So my plan, uh, the first few years of, gra after graduation, my first few years, I want to work as a software engineer. And then I would reevaluate whether I still have the passion for coding that I do now, um, whether a company is willing to sponsor my MBA and all of that. And also just because there is a bit of uncertainty around software engineering jobs now, and that would allow me to have an opportunity to protect my career if something were to happen. I, I don't think a lot of people think of it as deep as you do. It's just like whatever kind of floats their boat. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you've been pretty successful thus far in terms of your career and getting various interviews at like fang opportunities and i guess to start right there you probably have a pretty good resume and let's actually oh, put okay. it up on the screen right now all right so talk to us about your resume uh what are some good things about it okay so immediately uh, and this is a mistake that i see a lot of people making unfortunately uh, a resume will only be looked at at a maximum of seven seconds for each recruiter so with my resume, I made sure that everything that I wanted a recruiter to see will be seen immediately. Uh, and to do that, I made use of bolding to grab attention to important areas such as coding languages I used and overall impact I had. Uh, I also used mm -hmm. the very common uh, accomplished X through Y using Z method to write on my bullet points. 
and I actually stole this idea from watching Google uh, interviewers and recruiters mentioning what re resume structure they're looking for. So that's, I kind of structured my resume accordingly to how Fang resumes want to be built. Uh, I also incorporated business logic to highlight the impact I made in my previous jobs. And this is really important because a recruiter might not necessarily be a technical person. So if you're able to highlight the impact you make on a business, for example, the amount of money you saved, how much percentage of, of efficiency you increased, that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. it could really go a long way. Uh, and I also included links to my coding projects. That way, if someone more technical were to look at my resume, they'll be able to see my hands-on work firsthand. Uh, yeah. What, like, you did this cool thing, who cares? Or why was it important? And so mentioning that, you mentioned key technologies, numbers, that's good. And I like how you're very thoughtful of your bullet po or you're very thoughtful about your bulleting. I know uh, I do some resume reviews and sometimes people just bold in literally the most random things. Uh, like oh, every, yeah. every two sentence is just like some verb or noun just bolded but you you mainly bold your technologies and numbers which i think is a really good thing um yeah, yeah i yeah i mean hence why you've been successful so far and i guess on this point um kind of a little challenging question is if you could improve your resume what would you do to improve it okay so after looking through some of your videos in fact about the resume critiquing i oh. think one thing i would love to add would be some relevant coursework in my education section, just because that is something that some recruiters could be looking for, and I do have the space. Um, I would mm -hmm. also look to change my second coding project to incorporate something with machine learning maybe, or something that's AI based, but it's not just a wrap around the open AI API. And that's because from applying to around 300 jobs this internship cycle alone, I've seen that machine learning and AI are incredibly, incredibly in demand, so it wouldn't hurt just to Add that to my resume. So you would add that to your resume, but are would you go for like an AI role or is that still kind of, you haven't decided yet? I'm honestly undecided at this point, but it is something that I have considered for the future. So I'm currently, currently pursuing a, a minor in software engineering, but I'm debating switching that to a minor in AI in my fourth year. And yeah, that's, mm, so see. basically I would like to get some hands-on experience to figure out if that's something I want to work in in the future. But also AI is kind of the future. So there's an argument to yeah. be made that every software engineer should have some sort of experience with AI. So yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, And I guess uh, kind of an open general question, and I think you touched a little on this already, but what are the most common mistakes that students tend to make on their resumes? So I've seen the biggest mistake in my opinion is not including a GitHub profile or a LinkedIn profile. But especially as a software engineer, you need to be showing some way, some proof of all the experience you have, including your coding projects. And the first thing a lot of recruiters will look at is in fact your GitHub profile when they're interested in you because GitHub has a functionality which shows the amount of uh, pushes you made over the years so they can see if you're actually continuously coding. There are also features that highlight the coding languages that you used. For example, if I built a project in Python or Java, it would highlight and say Python Java used in this repository. And that way, even people that are not, uh, that don't have a technical background can then go open your GitHub and see if you've in fact used the coding languages that are on your resume and in the job description so they can see if you're a good fit for the role. Um, I would also say a lot of people do not quantify their accomplishments as much as possible. And I'm, I'm sure you've experienced, you've seen that yeah. firsthand with some of the resumes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's... Uh once again like the whole like numbers thing and just like not making it specific to your impact of like why people really care um yeah. and one of the biggest things that i see people make a mistake is actually formatting uh just like making the spacing between certain lines just making yeah. it uniform across the resume making like indentation uniform and i get a lot of comments actually on like um some of my videos is that like bro's doing too much or do people actually <laughs> care this much about your resume and i always tell people a recruiter looks at your resume for six to eight seconds right yeah 
why don't you try to make it as perfect as possible? Like, why would you yeah. take the chance of having a slightly imperfect resume and having it the chance of them tossing it out rather than focusing on perfecting it, getting all the details, getting all the formatting right? And so yeah. then you can at least have the satisfaction that you gave your best shot. You gave your best shot and I didn't make it rather than, oh, what if I just did that? And maybe I would have gotten an interview, you know? Yeah, exactly. And just to build on that, uh, keep in mind how competitive all of the software engineering roles are, especially now. So if there's even one thing that is on your resume that might make that might differentiate you from someone who could be more qualified, uh, it might just be the difference between you getting a call back and not. So really, uh, that's that's it. That is the biggest mistake I've seen people make on their resume. And it's not actually spending even a few days perfecting their resume because so many people will spend hours and hours and hours coding but then spend mm -hmm. under an hour building the resume and then wonder why they don't get a job. Yeah, I always yeah. think of it like when you, uh, a resume that isn't formatted properly is kind of like you going up to an interview and your tie's all messed up or your shirt's yeah. wrinkly. Yeah. Of course, it doesn't really, like, it doesn't show that you know some knowledge or you don't know some knowledge, but it's kind of like a just a professionalism type thing. It's like, why don't you make it look good, right? No, exactly, yeah. The question. Um, an another thing I would add too, and I'm sure you could agree with me here, is you need to be not underselling yourself. So I don't mean you lie here, but you need to be exaggerating some of your achievements. So for example, uh, instead of just writing in my resume, I'm like, oh, I designed AWS Lambda functions. I would, I mentioned that I saved $1,000 per large scale deployment. And in fact, if you break it down on my resume, I did save $1,000 per large scale deployment, but only on two or three deployments. But by the wording of my resume, I'm able to, it makes it look like it's a bigger achievement than what it is. And that's something that people have to learn to do when they write their resumes. Yeah, for sure. It's, um, it's not just about what you've done, but it's how you present yourself, right? Exactly, exactly. Uh, so let's shift a little away from your resume and talk about what you brought up a little earlier about coding projects. And I'm just curious, so in terms of not just coding projects you've done before, but for any student out there to get a software engineering internship, do you have any recommendations for particular coding projects as well as the skills and tools required to do so? Okay, so first of all, I'm gonna preface this by saying you cannot be including coding projects like a tic-tac-toe project, a to-do list, or a calculator on your resume and expect to get a job, especially at a FANG or a big tech company. Because think of all the thousands of people that have already done that and it doesn't show that you really know how to code on a deeper level. Mm -hmm. To pivot on that, what I would recommend is you build a coding project that A, you're really passionate about because it's an undervalued quality in your interviews to be able to talk about something you're passionate about and it will just increase the intention, the attention that a recruiter will put on you if it seems like you're actually interested in what you're talking about. Uh, and I would try to build a coding project that can impact multiple people's lives, even if it's just 10 people downloading an app that you built, 10 people visiting a website that you built, that active engagement goes a long, long way in a recruiter, recruiter's eye. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I always find it funny. It's like when I see like calculator uh, on a resume project, like as a coding project, yeah. like it's a good project to get your feet wet if you're trying to learn how to code. Oh, for sure. Don't get me wrong. Sure. Yeah, yeah, so it's it's a yeah. starter project, but yeah. uh, to put that on your resume and really expect for big things to happen is kind of ridiculous. Uh, yeah. But yeah, So and also like you th talk about like passion and like impactful projects. You know, something that I always mention is so, when I was in college, I did this machine learning course and uh, we actually created different algorithms to sort of determine based off of certain countries' indicators, how many COVID-19 deaths there would be. Oh, and okay. this was actually in the heights of the pandemic. So you could see yeah. the impact that it could potentially have. Yeah. Um, so th that that's... Uh, that, when you mentioned about that passionate impact, that kind of reminded me of it. But could you actually get a little more specific about like what coding projects that you have? Okay, so I do have four main coding projects in my coding portfolio. The biggest one being uh, a Premier League fantasy website, which is a full stack coding project. I'm a big, big 
a sports fan in general, but especially soccer. I've played and watched soccer since I've been three years old. So, of course, that's something I'm able to talk about extensively with anyone, any recruiter. And if someone is a sports fan or a soccer fan, it helps me build that human connection between a recruiter, yeah. which goes a long way in interviews. So, first of all, for any anyone who's not sure what they want to do uh, as a software engineer yet, whether it be front-end development, back-end development, data engineering, I highly, highly, highly recommend starting with a full-stack coding project mm. because especially... Just think of it uh, in the perspective of startups and smaller companies that do not have efficient resources to allocate funds to a bunch of different engineers. Mm -hmm. If you hire a full stack engineer who's able to work on multiple different aspects of web development, it's much more feasible financially. Mm -hmm. So you are increasing your odds of getting a job in the first place. And then you're also getting experience um, working with uh, all aspects of web development so you can figure out what you like. Mm -hmm. So myself, I started with data scraping uh, with Python and Beautiful Soup, so I kind of had some data engineering. I yeah. then migrated that into a SQL database, again, data engineering, worked on some backend with Java and Spring Boot, and then built a front-end application to connect all of this into a full-stack application with React. So mm -hmm. that's the kind of project you would be looking for to put on your resume to get the attention of a recruiter. Wait, that sounds pretty intense. You did, like, you had a lot of setup in the back end and the the front end. I mean, uh, how long did that take you to do? Honestly, I it was a very start stop project. So initially, uh -huh. I only started with the data scraping, right? Because I thought yeah. I was going to go into data engineering way back when. Uh, and then I really like had a th uh, sat down and thought about what I wanted to do as a software engineer. So I picked up the passion of back end engineering. Uh -huh. uh, and then over the summer, I spent maybe an hour a day, so not too much, not too much work, but an hour a day for around two weeks, just working on the coding project, oh, wow. uh, just eating away at it uh, day by day. And I was able to get it done relatively fast in two, two, three, two, three weeks, I'd say. Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. And uh, on this point, back end or front end, which one's better? Oh, that's, that's a controversial <laughs> question. I'm going <laughs> to offend someone here, but I definitely, definitely prefer back end engineering. What? Uh, <laughs> I love working with servers, um, APIs and all of that. And I really, really dislike working with uh, CSS and styling. And yeah. I've never been someone who's artistically inclined. And that's just not my kind of thing. So what okay. about you? So uh, I, th this is a tough question because I like both, but I always argue that Front end is not as bad as people say. I, I yeah. mainly code on the front end. React JS is kind of like my thing. Uh, yeah, of same. course, I don't like CSS. CSS is annoying and can never figure out how to do some things, you know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but like, what I love about front end is so let's just say you're working on this project and there's someone who doesn't really have much of a tech basis, right? They're asking yeah. about this project. For front end, it's so easy to explain and really show the impact that you're able to have versus mm -hmm. on the back end, you have to be kind of technologically inclined to even understand it. So yeah. kind of like from a work perspective, if you're trying to show off your accomplishments, front end, wow, that looks impressive. Back end, huh, I don't know if I fully understand it. Do, do you get what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do understand your point. And it yeah. is true, like if I was showing some of my friends my back end work, they would just see a bunch of colorful lines of code and not understand at all what's actually going on. But when I show them a website that yeah, I spend even a day on, they're just impressed because it looks so beautiful, you know? Yeah. So yeah. that that is definitely that's definitely the like bright side of front-end engineering. Yeah. Uh, I would argue, though, that the majority of the money is in back-end engineering nowadays. Uh, and front-end engineering could be oversaturated. Yeah, no, th that's valid because, uh, I mean really anyone can kind of do front end every like front end is developed on some like usually like javascript framework right all the frameworks for the front ends are all already there but the cool like innovative stuff is usually the back end that's where a lot of these like software as service companies their proprietary items are back end cuz it's the logic behind the system that makes the money right not the not yeah, the exactly. pretty colors right <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah. No, so so I understand that. That's why like I enjoy backend and like personally like I do some backend stuff. It's just that 
for for the other aspects of like the the impact and like kind of also having the satisfaction of accomplishment of like being able to see the work that you've done and like show yeah, it off that's, is yeah. that's definitely a bright like, side. Uh, yeah yeah um but anyways let's uh pivot over to helping our audience actually get into understanding what matters to getting a software engineering internship and i want to ask you three questions gpa yeah. school and coding languages what about these okay three? so does gpa matter so I get that question all the time, and I'm assuming it's typically from people that are struggling with their GPA. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing I would say for people that don't have the best GPA, don't worry too much because yes, GPA does matter, but nowhere near as it's made out to be. And it exponentially decreases with the more experience you have. Mm -hmm. So just always try your best and know that uh, no matter what you do, how bad your GPA is, especially as a software engineer, there are ways to cover up for that for example if you have very good coding projects that showcase your skill set and you write a quality resume no one is going to care about your gpa and in yeah. fact don't even include it on your resume if it's not a top uh not a top gpa yeah i actually i i always tell people that with the exception of one company no company has ever asked me for my gpa and the one company that did just wanted to make sure it was above a 3.0 so yeah tech companies really don't care uh, like you said if you've worked at some pretty names like companies or you go to a nice school yeah. your, your gpa yeah, doesn't really matter right oh for sure uh, I, i've even seen some of my friends uh mm -hmm. who work at fang that have a below three gpa at certain points and oh, wow. it's yeah exactly yeah but, but then they're just the type of people that can really really code they don't yeah. inc include the GPA on the resume, and it's not going to be a deal breaker necessarily. It's just mm. going to be something that might be brought up if you're level with a certain candidate. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, it's just like a small detail. But what about the next question? So, does school matter to where you go? So, I would argue it's the same as GPA. It might be a bit more important here because prestige of a school can go a long way. There's even stuff like connections that you make at your school, right? Like, yeah, yeah like M McGill is known for its prestige. So just the name of McGill might open some doors for me. But again, uh, it's just opening the doors. And I still have to, no matter what, you still have to be really good at coding. You have to, you know, have really good coding projects. You need to be able to, um, you need to grind lead code, master your algorithms to ace interviews and all of that. So in the grand scheme of things, the school you go to doesn't matter too much either. It is a good stepping stone. And again, once you get that first prod, uh, first uh, internship or first work experience, like you said, um, doors open so, and they really don't care as much anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, so when people ask me this question, I always, I give different responses based off who's asking me because it's yeah. either one, a high school student who's interested about potentially going to a university or transferring to um, like a top tech school. And then obviously yeah. try to get into the best school that you're able to get into and the one that you can afford. But the second type of people who ask questions are people who have been struggling to get an internship and are not at a good school. They're like, yeah. man, but the thing is, what are you going to do then? Are you just going to be like, oh, oh man, I, 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 I can't get, get anything, so I'm just not going to try. No, like, you may not be at the best school, but that doesn't mean you can't get into a top tech school. Like, I have yeah. friends and people I know who have gone from community college to a state school and ended up in Fang. So it certainly does help to go to a better school for the networking opportunities or even, uh, like, the big tech probably visit top schools more than they visit not top schools. But it still is possible to get into a top tech company. Yeah, hundred percent. And at the end of the day, all the, all a recruiter cares about is your resume and whether or not you're a quality fit for the job. And the school is just a name. So for people that aren't in like the good schools, like you said, all it should be is more motivation to make sure you are a top candidate, like spend all that time working on your coding projects, master, your algorithms and lead code, like I said, and it really should not make a big difference in the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, kind of pivoting from there, so uh, 
do coding languages matter? I know a lot of people are, or at least when I was a freshman, I had the ambition of like learning every single language out there. I was like, yeah. I'm just going to stack my resume, Java, Python, C, C++, C Sharp, <laughs> uh, Swift, like uh, you name the language, I probably tried to learn it. Uh, but it yeah. doesn't matter. Well, I, I know we've all been there as software engineers where you watch one five minute YouTube video and you just add it on your resume and you're yeah. like, oh, I'm, I'm a master. Hello world. And, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, oh, I know React after figuring out how to print hello world, yeah. like that kind of thing. So it is an interesting question because if you do have the coding language that, that a recruiter could be looking for on your resume, uh, yeah. and if you have a more flexible tech stack, you become more valuable as a web developer. So it does get you more interviews but if you don't actually know these coding languages it's bound to show eventually so for example even back uh back when i was a freshman we mm -hmm. were learning c in uh in my first classes but like very very basic basic levels and mm -hmm. i put it on my resume got an oa in c for a tech company uh -huh. and i had no idea what was going on oh. that's just <laughs> yeah exactly Man. yeah and I know a lot of people that will get caught like that. So basically, you're getting yourself the interview, but then you have to do the interview, and it'll show that you don't know the actual language. And then yeah. you end up just wasting more time, if anything. Mm -hmm. So honestly, I don't know about you, but I would recommend you master one or two coding languages, specifically mm -hmm. for your OAs and interviews. I'm mm -hmm. a big fan of Python. So mm -hmm. what about you? What would you say your favorite language is? Yeah, so oh. favorite, yeah, probably Python, just like how efficiently you can code. And um, I always like on your on your point of like mastering one to two programming languages. So I always say start with Python or personally, I started with Java because like AP computer science. So yeah. Python, Java, um, and I also like a pretty easy thing to pick up on to do projects for. I recommend JavaScript. You can create like a portfolio mm -hmm. website. You can do like some of your web app projects with it. So I would say like stick with maybe like, yeah, one, two, or like in this case, like three programming languages that I've mentioned. So know your data structures and algorithms and just do projects. You'll be good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And just to build on that, uh, have those core languages. And if you later decide you want to go into data engineering or backend engineering, for example, maybe add one language that relates to that field. So mm -hmm. data engineering could be SQL, for example, backend, you could try to go into Spring Boot applications with Java. Yeah. Right. So it's just building on languages you already know. And that's the kind of idea you want to kind of build out your resume according to the job you're looking for and not just putting a bunch of random stuff on your resume. Yeah. For sure, for sure. Um, and all right, so th that's cool. And now I want to get into like you specifically. So yeah. most people who uh, I've seen on either like TikTok or Instagram are usually like US based people telling us about how to get into tech companies, but you're located in Canada. And I yeah. actually wanted to get into what are like tech opportunities like in Canada versus the US? Okay, so first of all, the Canadian tech market is a bit different in that job opportunities tend to open up closer to the internship start date. So okay. unlike in America, where even like I know Google for the 2024 software engineering internship role, they started taking applications in June of 2023. Like that's how early American companies tend to yeah, start yeah. looking for. Yeah. And in Canada, I would even say there are very minimal amount of jobs, even in the bigger companies open until December. Like I know Google only opened theirs in October for Canada. So it shows like a four or five month difference already mm -hmm. there for the same company, same role, just different countries. Uh -huh. uh, personally, I've already applied to 300 internships just because I know the tech market is brutal. Yeah. And I'm looking to get like anything like it's just a numbers game at this point. Yeah. And over 70% of the jobs I've found are in America, which kind of shows the discrepancy in opportunities. Yeah. Um, yeah, because really, I'm sure you could agree, the majority of the tech jobs that are worthwhile going to, especially mm -hmm. if you're looking for Fang and whatnot in the bigger tech companies, uh, they're going to be located in Seattle, San Francisco, or yeah. New York. And it's really hard as a Canadian to compete 
as a Canadian company to compete with those locations. Like there's maybe Toronto, but that's about as close as you could get to those areas. I see. Wait, so are you trying to get into the U.S. Uh, for that? I'm, I wouldn't mind uh, transitioning to U.S. So I know my career plan is to move to the U.S. after uh, university just because, like I said, if just being located in one of the big tech companies like Austin, Seattle, San Francisco, etc., I'm bound to increase my chances of getting a job alone, you know? Uh, yeah, I just want to be in that tech hub, that environment. And yeah. unfortunately, Canada doesn't really have something that's similar to it. So, mm-hmm. yeah. All right, cool. So I don't want to take too much of your time, but just one final question. So you know how like everyone's talking about how AI is going to take over the tech world, or the AI takeover, yeah. right? So yeah. is it still worth it going into software engineering? And what's going to be the impact AI has? Okay, so 1 million percent, yes, software engineering is still worth it. And it's going to be worth it for at least 10 to 20 more years, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, Because even though AI is a very useful tool, it still lacks human creativity, uh, intuition, and the expertise to be able to successfully program. Mm -hmm. Um, As it stands, I've seen graphs showing uh, ChatGPT can't even solve the simple, easy Leeco questions, and they only get it correct around 28% of the time. And if they can't even do these easy Leeco questions, how can you expect them to, how can you expect AI to replace software engineers completely? Yeah. And if you've worked in the field, I'm sure uh, where you work, you've actually used AI as a tool. Like think of it kind of like a calculator, it just makes doing math easier, mm-hmm. but you still need the mathematician to do yeah. the, the math, right? Yeah, so. exactly, exactly. Like AI is always like, uh, complement it's not a substitute because i mean the tech industry is not just a bunch of people just typing code no it's actually yeah. like planning strategizing flow charting and dealing with customers like t- tech yeah. escalations and you can't just like throw chat gpt at everything like there's uh, no, exactly, there's limitations yeah. to this yeah um but i mean i do think that there are is a potential upside of this of potential new job opportunities. So, yeah. what w- what do you what do you think about that? What what's what's going to be the landscape of that when AI comes? Well, I'm sure everyone on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, like you've all seen those crazy videos of new grad and junior roles be- being offered 600k yearly just because they're working in AI research and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So that alone should tell you that that's how much companies are willing to pay for someone to get some knowledge on AI. So you can see that there are a bunch of research opportunities available. Mm -hmm. And yes, it has created new jobs. And I'm sure I'm sure people have asked you this question too. Like, do you think that AI will replace any software engineering jobs in the future? So I would be lying if I said no. Because I I think like when AI like fully develops like after that ten twenty year mark, yeah, there are gonna be some roles that are gonna be let go. Just like there will be in any industry, right? When as we're moving more technology basis, like for example, now in McDonald's you have like those kiosks rather than having a bunch of uh, cashiers. It's just kind of yeah. bound to happen. But I would say we're safe for like next t- ten twenty years, and also. You should learn how to use AI rather than being scared of it, um, yeah. because only only the people who understand how the AI is going to be working are going to be people who will have a lot of job security. Because if you don't know, you're not valuable, right? So yeah, that's exactly. that's my response there. Uh, just to add on to that, like you mentioned, the kiosks and whatnot. Mm-hmm. I even went to dinner the other day, and there were robots replacing the waiters that brought me my sushi. Oh, was, robot servers? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, that's yeah, cool. so, <laughs> yeah, so you could already see how AI is going to take over some jobs. And in my opinion, minimum wage jobs are the first ones that are going to go before software engineering. Yeah. So if you're thinking about entering software engineering, and you're like, oh, I don't know because AI might take it over. Is it going to be worth it? Just keep in mind that if... AI is good enough to replace a software engineer entirely. It's what else is it good enough to do? Yeah, How many other exactly. jobs are going to be taken? You know? Yeah, exactly. There's going to be, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And uh, I was actually in, I was 
in San Francisco and Austin and I was seeing these like drive like driverless cars on the road like yeah literally just yeah. like passengers driving by and they're actually like apparently somewhat safer than actual like taxi drivers so, so, yeah. pro probably in some cities that's true uh but yeah it's crazy like there's so much potential for it to replace but yeah if it's able to take coding jobs too like that's that's that, that, that then we're like what what else is what else is there to do right yeah, at that point we just gotta wonder like, what what is the world gonna look like? You know, if yeah. if software engineers are replaced by AI, what other jobs? But again, the we're bound to just make new jobs with AI. It's gonna be people mm -hmm. that have to monitor the outputs of the AI and stuff like that. So it wouldn't be a direct replacement. It's just gonna be a shift in what software engineers do. So exactly. for example, a graphic designer might combine with front end engineers, so they would just submit what they want a website to look like to AI and then make sure it outputs exactly what they're looking for, like that kind of idea. Interesting, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Th yeah. That's actually a yeah. perfect way to put it, yeah. Kind of consolidation yeah. and efficiency yeah. and like who knows what the potential could be look like, looking like. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. All right, uh, well, thank you so much, Eric, for joining on today's podcast. I really hope that this was beneficial for the viewers. I mean, I learned a lot in today's video and uh, yeah, well, just thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, all right, take care. Take care.